back down when it ends. You might want to try saying three little words to yourself. I am excited. In these studies, we had people say, I'm excited. And when people said that, when they reappraised their anxiety as excitement, they actually gave better public speeches, they sang better in our karaoke lounge, and they did better on math tasks. It sounds too simple to be true, but what you're really doing is getting yourself out of a threat mindset where you're focused on all the things that could go wrong and into an opportunity mindset where you're thinking about all the good things that could happen if you do well. They weren't actually less anxious, right? They, were, they just did better. That's right. So anxiety, the arousal stays high and you stay in that high arousal state and just flip from negative to positive, from anxiety to excitement. The reason is anxiety and excitement have a lot more in common than you might think. They're both aroused emotions. In both, the heart beats faster, cortisol surges, and the body prepares for action. It's much easier to get from anxiety to excitement than it is from anxiety to calm. In Brooke's study, after saying, I'm excited, people sang 17% better, were 17% more persuasive at speaking, and did 22% better on a math test than people who said nothing or tried to remain calm. Now there's a couple a couple things in there that I think are important to key on. Number one, better on a math test. If we look at the faster cortisol surges and the body prepared to excitement than it is from anxiety. At this graph here, uh, you know, as, especially for for the parents out there, when our child says that they are anxious or nervous about a situation, what's our typical response? Calm down try to calm yourself down, take some deep breaths, try to calm down. But as this research shows, that actually can be counterproductive to what we're trying to do, which is to enhance performance because it's often impossible to move from this state of anxiety down here to the state of calm. It's, and, and when you're unable to change that state that you're in, that can actually increase those anxiety levels further hampering your performance. And this, this is well known by a lot of professional musicians, a lot of professional athletes, but it's much easier to move here from anxiety to excitement. And that's why this trick works. Uh, and again, a lot of the physical physiological responses are the same when we're anxious or excited. The difference is that when you are excited about something, so you, I mean, you might think about a, uh, a hitter in a baseball game who's got to go up with, two outs and the game is on the line, there's a lot of pressure there. And if that hitter is thinking about everything that could go wrong, if they're, if they're in a state of anxiety, do we think that is gonna help them hit the ball and help their team? No, we don't. Uh, and what is more helpful is to think about things that could go well as a result of doing well, to try to be excited. That brings you back to the present moment to the and executing the task at hand. And then just to, to really bring this home, I think the, uh, the research they did here was great. So you can see here, this is a, they saw a 22% bump in math scores. And that was on a standardized test, much like the ACT or the SAT, where we saw a, a major improvement in math scores as a result of this exercise. Uh, and then at Test Prep Gurus, we followed that up because we have several hundred students in any given month that are taking different practice tests, uh, whether here or in, in, in neighboring states. Uh, and, and we're able to run experiments with those students and say, hey, we're going to try this performance enhancer right before you take this practice test. Let's see if that results in a bump in your scores. And we've been able to see a measurable difference with it. So we know this works on standardized exams. I think it is also interesting, though, that they ran an experiment to test uh, random participants in their karaoke lounge where they actually measured octave tone and pitch with software. And so this wasn't a subjective judgment. Uh, and, and because for most people, maybe not some of our OSHA students, but for most people singing in, a, in, in front of a, a bunch of strangers is a very anxiety producing situation. And uh, just by even people that did not want to do it, that were freaking out, if they, all they had to do ahead of time is just say, I'm excited to sing this song in front of you guys the software measured an improvement in octave tone and pitch. So this is something that really does work. I really encourage it. Uh, if you're going into an AP exam, a big test in school or a standardized test to really supercharge it, write freehand 
for 60 seconds to two minutes. Keep your pencil or pen moving that entire time on the piece of paper and just try to concentrate on all the things that could go well as a result of doing well in that situation. It absolutely helps. It's a, it's a, it's a great tool. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about college admissions in general. The idea here is we're going to get we're going to get the big picture and then we're going to zero in to the PSAT and the pre-ACT and then we're going to come come back out uh, to the big picture at the end so you know exactly where you're at in the process and how you're moving through this. Okay. I've just got to move. And then if anyone has questions along the way, feel free to chat those into the chat box. I can see that on my screen and then I can, can jump on, on those questions. Um, how does the college process, college admissions process work? So there, there are three major parts. And the first one are the numbers. A lot of college admissions officers refer to that as the academic standards, as you can see there. And that basically exit is, is uh, there are two pieces to that, your transcript and then your SAT or ACT score. Now, we've been experimenting this year with or over the last uh, two cycles here of, of some students uh, entering into this process without an SAT or ACT score. And on the next slide, we'll talk about what that, what we've seen from that, what we've learned from that. Fortunately, the majority of you are in the 10th grade and even you 11th graders are in a great position as well, because now we know how colleges are using these scores and, and we'll, we'll discuss how they can help you in this in this process. The second piece of it is going to be your story, and that's going to be your college admission essays. That's going to be your extracurriculars, your letters of recommendation. And I'm not going to dive too deep into that, but I do want to push this idea that, that what we want to have with the, the reason that, that at Test Prep Gurus, we refer to this as your story, is we want all those things to tie in to one coherent theme. And by that, I mean, if you say you want to study, let's pick a major, um, <laughs> you want to go pre-med at a given college. They'd like to see on your transcripts that you did well in your math and science courses. Then they'd like to see some touches on that in your essays and the stories you tell about yourself and, and who you are and what makes you tick. Hopefully you've got some extracurriculars that tie into that and some letters of recommendation just that are reinforcing the same themes. And so it's a really good idea. Develop that relationship with your teachers now for all you 10th all you, uh, graders. Develop that relationship with your counselor now. I don't think you can start that process too soon so that these people really know you, who you are. And, and by the time you get to be a senior, they're familiar with your journey. Uh, there's just something, those letters of recommendation, if, it's, if you're asking a counselor that you have never spoken to through the course of your four years at the high school and, and the week before it's due, you ask someone to write one, it just isn't gonna have the same pop to it because that person won't know those little intimate details about you that'll really make that letter stand out and tie everything together. And then the last piece are finding right fit colleges. And, and that's a process you will work with your counseling team at OSHA on. Uh, they will help you to identify the right schools for you that are a good fit academically that have those other programs that uh, that line up with what you're really interested in, what you're passionate about, and are going to help you take the next step, uh, not just in college, but to use college to take those next major steps in life. Okay, now I do want to just define a few terms here because there's a lot of confusion going around about SAT, ACT scores. Test optional is very different from test blind. Now, test optional means that those scores can help your application if you submit them, but they're not required. So you could submit an application without an SAT or an ACT score. I would note earning straight A's and taking AP courses are also optional, right? I mean, everything in this process is essentially optional. I've always been a proponent of the test optional movement. So more colleges going test optional now, uh, the vast majority of them are, are test optional, I think is a good thing. It opens up new pathways for different students to be admitted, even if most students, it still benefits them to send in a test score. 
And then test blind, that's our other term here, test blind would be a college that will not look at your scores and say, I am, I am absolutely blind to those scores. Even if you send them, I'm not going to look at them. The major system that is doing that is the, is the UC systems. So that'd be all of our UC campuses, UC Irvine, UCLA, San Diego, on down. They will not look at your scores as they pertain to admission to those campuses. We'll dig into the UCs in a little bit. Uh, I do think it's good to note, though, even the UCs are still using scores for course placement if you send them to them. And that can be really helpful in, the, in these UC systems where they have so, so many students and it can be difficult to get those intro classes. Oftentimes with an SAT or an ACT score, you can test out of that entry level class and then you're getting the classes you want right from the get go. Now, what have we learned over, uh, so of course, during the 2020 pandemic, many, everyone said, hey, we're going to be test optional. You don't have to send a test if you don't want to. So there was wide variation from one college to another. Some schools had as low as 30 or 40% of students sending in scores. Others saw as many as 80 to 90% sending in scores. So we, we had this, this big experiment took place. And one thing that college admissions officers really honed in on having dealt with that is that inflation uh, doesn't only exist at the grocery store. That, we've, that with grade inflation, it became much more difficult to separate students in this admissions process. And um, I think a, a telling piece of information, 47% of college bound seniors are now at a 3.7 or higher GPA. And then if we look, this is over a 20 year period, we've got um, D's and F's moving down, C's moving down, B's moving down, and it's, it's A's taking up all the slack. And so this is a nationwide movement that has, uh, there's just been a shift towards more and more A's coming out. Um, and then in, the, in the, the biggest research study ever done on SAT and ACT scores, and ironically, it was done at the UC system uh, when, when they were uh, examining scores, uh, this is directly from the report that test scores, SAT and ACT, are better predictors of first year GPA than high school grade point average. And, and essentially the reason, uh, you can read the rest, uh, it's up there on your screen, but the reason was grade inflation. And so all this to say that college admissions officers, when they see an SAT or an ACT score, they know that it's not indicative of a student's potential, of their capability. They know that it's not really telling them, certainly not their intelligence, it's not telling them anything of, of intrinsic value about the student. The reason they value the scores, and they've, they've been able to articulate this, I think a little bit better now, is that it's a common yardstick for all these students. When you have students that are applying from all over the country, and these days from all over the world to our, our most selective colleges, that common yardstick is really useful to, under, to put the grades in context. And it's just another data point that essentially helps them to say yes to you as a student. Headlines. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many people have called, emailed, or come up to me randomly on the street, neighbors coming and asking me uh, with, with big news when things drop like this, that Harvard dropped the SAT and the ACT. Um, now, did, did they drop the SAT and the ACT? They did not. Uh, that, that, is, that is not true, but the headlines would have you think that they did. If we actually read the articles, these are taken directly from those articles that said Harvard dropped it. Anyone applying to enter Harvard can choose whether to submit a score. The dean from Georgetown is quoted in there because he talked about great inflation, which we've already spent some time on. Um, and you can see from the rest of it that uh, college admissions officers, they like that there are new pathways for certain students, but the scores still have their place in this, in this process. And I think uh, this is just the new world we live in where most news is now created for free, but the price we pay is that news has become an advertising driven business and advertising revenue is based on clicks. And so if you're gonna write an article and you want anyone to look at it in order to generate that ad revenue, you've gotta write a headline that will generate clicks. 
And if they had said Harvard chooses to extend their test optional policy through 2026, or Harvard decided that they will continue to use the SAT and the ACT on a test optional basis, they wouldn't have received as many clicks as when they say they dropped the SAT or the ACT. Uh, the downside of that is that it does cause confusion out there amongst people. And so that's what we're doing tonight is clearing up some of that confusion. So again, you can make good informed decision for your in decisions for your students. Uh, and then I think the right question, because not everyone needs to take an SAT or an ACT, if, and, and you are in a, a very fortunate position by attending a school like OSHA, where you have talented college counselors who can help you answer this question, which is we want to ask, will a score help me? Now, you may be in a situation where you are an extremely talented artist of some kind coming from OSHA, and you're primarily going to be judged on your portfolio. And now that SAT or ACT score is optional, and your counselor may say, hey, at X, Y, and Z schools, you're not going to need to submit a score. This is a very personal situation. And so there aren't a lot of universal answers on that. If you have, if you're taking uh, a route that is not the, the traditional path into college, i.e. A, a special talent, um, a, you're applying to a very specialized program, you are a historic, from a historically underrepresented group. Those students, I would say, definitely talk to your counselors, have an individual conversation to decide if those test scores will, will make sense for you. The thing we have seen, though, uh, with the 2020 admission cycle, and then the results we're already seeing for this 2021 admission cycle, is that the standardized tests are a lot less optional for students that attend high-performing high schools, and OSHA would be one of those schools, for students who are not first generation to college, for students, um, well, essentially, if a student lives in, a, in an area where there are uh, strong performing high schools, then they attend one of those high schools, most colleges are going to assume that you have the resources, the time, the energy to prepare for those tests and take those tests. Um, and so a lot of the alternative pathways are, are being reserved for students who are not coming from a place of high resources, again, who are from these historically underrepresented groups in college, um, where uh, that I mentioned before, if your parents didn't attend college, um, or if you're, you're coming from a, a, a low performing high school and live in an area with a lot of those. Okay, and is everybody able to use the chat? Because I haven't seen anything pop up in there yet. I just wanted to make sure that's on for everybody. Um, okay, and if you do have a question, feel free to fire it in there. All right, and then our last bit on, on this, um, optional but preferred is just one one last piece of data to, to kind of wrap this up. Even during the pandemic in 2020, where many students in many states were, were really unable to take a test, at uh, the Ivy League's University of Pennsylvania, 75% of the students who were admitted did so with an SAT or an ACT score. Oh, I, I did I did just add this. Uh, to the process, because these are things that we have just seen recently. We've also seen the scores are highly tied to scholarships. And these were actual California students. And I thought this was interesting because we saw TCU is a great example. So we saw a couple of students who were admitted to TCU and did not send in scores. So they were still admitted. However, they had to pay the full sticker price and the students that did send in scores, this is an example here, a student who scored a, a 31 on the ACT, they were receiving huge, huge merit-based financial aid. And merit-based aid comes in the form of scholarships. So that's money that you don't have to pay back. And it is primarily based on your standardized test scores and your GPA. And so what I think we are uh, seeing, at least in the current admission cycle, and this may continue, if more students apply without scores, the ones that apply with scores tend to receive much more favorable financial aid packages. 
By the time you 10th graders become seniors, I think we'll be closer to an equilibrium uh, that's more similar to, to pre-pandemic. Um, but I, I, I still think this is, the test optional is here to stay. And I think financial aid being closely tied to scores and grades is also here to stay. And I see that question up there. What is the average SAT or ACT score that would be exceptional to, uh, that would be acceptable to report to a test optional school? We are gonna tackle that in, in just a minute. Um, and we'll get to that. And uh, why are colleges sending students emails? That is a, that's a great question, um, and, and we can tackle that real quick. Uh, so colleges send students a lot of emails and things in the in the snail mail as well, uh, glossy flyers and and exciting videos on email. They want you to apply, right? Um, colleges only stand to gain when applications go up. It does a couple of things. One, it makes the college look more selective because they're not admitting any more students. So if more students apply, their selectivity actually goes down, which makes them more, it makes them look more attractive in those emails they send you. And it helps them in the college rankings game, which is still very, very strong and alive uh, for these colleges. Plus they receive a fee every time a student sends in an application. And as those fees continue to climb each year, and we're talking tens of thousands of students that are applying to these, uh, to the, the selective colleges, uh, there's there's a lot of money at stake. Um, and I actually think that is the number one driver that, that uh, will keep test optional here to stay because when a school goes test optional, applications go up. And that was always the case pre-pandemic. Uh, the Uni University of Chicago has been test optional uh, since 2018. And uh, they, they really, again, they only stand to gain by going test optional because applications go up as a result. So that's why they're going to send you a lot of emails to try to entice you to apply to their school. Okay. Um, my daughter's not received her pre-ACT scores, so and, and it's a good time to tackle that as well. Your pre-ACT scores you need to pick up at school from your, uh, and, and do they pick those up uh, from their counselor or from, from your office directly, Ms. Ms. Lyons? I, you're going to pick those up at school either way. You're going to pick the, your pre-ACT scores. That's still on paper. So you're going to pick those up at school in person. And then the PSAT score, you can access that online. And I'm going to show everybody how to do that momentarily. Sorry about that, Nick. I wasn't able to, to unmute myself. Oh, yeah. Um, they were, uh, and Allie, correct me if I'm wrong, they were passed out today in the breezeway. We even had a couple of kids come in right before the Zoom started uh, to pick them up. If they didn't pick them up today, they can come in to um, T100, and we're more than happy to get them out to them. Okay, great. Great. Uh, now the UCs, the UCs have gone test blind and that should be here to stay for a while. They will not be using SAT and ACT scores in their admissions process. What that means for students and parents is that if you really have your heart set on a particular UC campus, your AP classes and AP scores will take on more importance. Uh, I. I don't know that this new way of doing things actually makes sense because they said they went test blind uh, to, to offer more access to more students. At underperforming schools, often these AP courses are not even offered. And so uh, I don't know that it actually makes sense, but I do know the truth of the situation is the UCs were uh, hit with a large lawsuit as it relates to discrimination over the test, and that is actually the reason they went test blind. Um, but in any, it doesn't even matter why. What matters is that they are test blind, and that uh, for parents and students, your AP scores will take on extra importance at the UCs, and you won't need to submit a score to them. The Cal States, 
We need to wait and see if they're going to go test optional the in the coming cycle, which would be the uh, 2022 cycle or the 2023 cycle. They have indicated that they are leaning in that direction. Again, look beyond the headlines because it'll say that they are thinking about dropping the SAT and ACT requirement. But what that what that really translates to is that they're thinking about going test optional. Um, and it's just, it's the best way for them to say that in this politically charged environment. Okay. And then to sum up here, because we were talking about a high school in California, if you're only applying to UC campuses, you definitely will not need scores. If you're applying to UCs plus other colleges, especially those selective ones, or uh, financial aid, I mean, who doesn't like free money? If financial aid is important, um, then you're going to, you scores will help you. And then of course, if you're applying to colleges and not, uh, to many colleges, but not any of the UCs, scores will definitely help in, in that situation. Okay, and then there was one other uh, question here on, um, how do you know if you have a good score for a given college? And there's a slide here at the end. Uh, I really do believe that there is no such thing as a good or bad score, right? Because these tests, again, are not intelligence tests. There are only scores that are gonna help you get into certain colleges. So if you scroll to the top of the chat box, there's a link, and I don't think you're able to see it on the screen, but if you scroll to the top of the chat box, there's a link there, www.prepgurus.com uh, slash resources. And if you click on that link in the chat box, it will take you to a page. There are two flyers there. One is, shows all the differences between the SAT and the ACT. And then the other flyer shows the uh, range of scores, the typical competitive range of scores at the 100 most popular colleges. And so those are two really useful tools in this process. And a lot of your questions will be answered just by looking through those flyers. And I actually think you can digest that information better through the flyers rather than, than me um, talking about all of that. Um, and then you've also uh, have are, is, is OSHA still using uh, Naviance? I believe they are. Um, but in there, you can look at different schools and what the typical competitive range of, school, of scores are given GPA and standardized test score from actual past OSHA students. It's a really wonderful tool to use as well. And then keep putting your questions into the chat. What I'll do is I'll, I'll go through the PSAT stuff and the pre-ACT stuff now. And then at the end, I'll come back to any questions that we have not answered already. Sound good? All right. Okay, so the first thing, and you can see the, the login address is up there at the top, that you're gonna go to your College Board account to log in. That's the first step. You punch in your username and password or create one if you haven't done so already. Then you will see a dashboard that is going to have, this student has an SAT test, a PSAT test, and then a subject test, which those don't exist anymore. So pay no attention to the subject test. And then you would click on your PSAT score and we would look over here where it would look like this online PSAT report. The main things here are the, the uh, you've got a total score and then you have a verbal score and then a math score. And the SAT is pretty simple. We take that verbal score and that math score, add them together and you have a total score. One thing to note on the PSAT, that score is capped at 1520. And the, uh, the real SAT, the full length SAT goes up to 1600. The reason they cap the PSAT at 1520 is that it's half as long and students tend to fatigue in the second half of the test. Uh, plus they take off the most high level difficulty questions out of the PSAT. And so the idea is that uh, you could score a little bit higher on the actual SAT. And, and so inevitably people ask why, why is 1520 the top score? Um, and that is the reason. Okay, and then we don't need to talk about the PSAT report. This is a test prep guru's version of that report. And you guys took the real thing. 
Um, here we are with the 1520 and um, I don't think we need to play this video here. So I'm gonna move past that one. Test questions, please. Okay, and we just talked about what is a good score. Remember, there are no good or bad scores. There are only scores that are going to help you reach your goals for college. Again, parents, we wanna reinforce this message with our students because there is a big anxiety piece with these tests. And the, and the more we can take the, that edge off, the better our students are going to perform on these tests, the better they're gonna feel about it. It's really a win-win situation. And I can tell you from experience, uh, a perfect score on the SAT will not even get you a free cup of coffee at your local coffee shop. It doesn't really mean anything other than can it help you to take the next step on the path that, that you wanna take in life. Here are the two flyers uh, that I mentioned before. Again, that link is in the uh, top of the chat box. And at the end, I'll make sure to chat it in there again, just so everybody has that and can download those two flyers. Okay, um, let's talk about national merit scholarships because those are tied to your PSAT scores. And I know there's a, a question about that in the chat. You cannot qualify for the National Merit Scholarship as a 10th grader. It only applies during your junior year. So I'm going to play this video on National Merit Scholarships, and then we'll talk about what it means for you as sophomores next. National Merit Scholarship Selection. The Selection Index Score is used for determining National Merit Scholarships. This student selection score is 124. The 124 is derived from three raw scores from each section of the PSAT. We're going to add the three scores together, multiply by two, and we get 124. Just to keep you on your toes, the College Board decided to put the National Merit Selection Index score on yet another scale. This one ranges from 48 to 228. A quick review of the eligibility requirements for National Merit Scholarships. The key one here is that sophomores cannot qualify, only juniors. Approximately 1.6 million students take the PSAT annually. Of those, just about 1% will be semifinalists. About half of semifinalists then go on to win scholarships. So this is not easy by any stretch. Please note that if you qualify as a National Merit Semifinalist, your high school will notify you of this honor in early September of your senior year. Key point, this is a state-by-state -state competition, and the barriers to entry vary considerably from one state to another. Notice that the five highest scoring states typically see cutoffs ranging from 220 to 224, while the five lowest scoring states typically see cutoffs that are 10 points lower, which is a considerable difference. Okay. There, and I just posted that link back into the chat again, just to make sure everyone has that. Again, that's where you can download that SAT versus ACT flyer, as well as the uh, scores at the 100 most popular colleges. Uh, so the National Merit uh, Scholarship, it is, determined based on a different scale. And I won't get into all of that because I don't want to get lost in the weeds on that tonight. Uh, the very short version is that the verbal scores count twice as much towards your National Merit Scholarship. The National Merit Scholarship, it's, it's not a huge monetary reward, but it is a, a big gold star on your applications. And, uh, and there was a question earlier about, about colleges emailing students. If you, during your junior year, score exceptionally high on the PSAT, wow, will you see a lot of emails and, and uh, mail from colleges after that, because they will really try to entice you to apply to their colleges. However, your PSAT score, other than this National Merit Scholarship, does not have any impact on your applications. So it really is a dry run to it's, it's great practice. You get to see where you would currently score on an actual SAT without having any consequences. For students who scored 1300 or higher as a 10th grader, it might be a good idea going into junior year to do some preparation for the PSAT. So that would be next year, next October. Sorry, it's really 
dry in here. I, uh, and I, I, uh, have to keep drinking water. We've, I've been doing so many of these high school talks, uh, uh ever since the, the turn of the year. Um, it, so you're going to take the PSAT again as a junior October of your junior year. It might be a good idea to prep for that test then to try to push your scores up into this national merit range. If you're within striking distance of one of those scholarships. And again, if you, if you scored over 1300 as a 10th grader, uh, I would say you're within striking distance of getting there as, as a junior. Um, but again, it's, it's less than the top 1% of PSAT takers in California. So usually some work is necessary to get a score that, that is high enough uh, to get into that range. National merit. Okay, so next steps based on grade level. And I know there were some, some questions about this as well. Let's talk about what you're going to actually do with these scores. Uh, first thing, every college will accept SAT or ACT, assuming they are a test optional school or one of those schools in Florida and Georgia that still require scores. Nobody wants both an SAT and an ACT. So it really behooves each individual student to figure out which test you're better at and then focus on one exam entirely on one exam. This is one chart that compares SAT and ACT scores. The reason, uh, and we've, we've consulted with OSHA over this, that the reason that in 10th grade you're taking a pre-ACT pre and a PSAT is so that you could compare those two scores to one another to figure out which path you'd be um, would be better for you. I would encourage you to ask your counselor by comparing those two scores, or feel free, you can send us an email, attach those um, uh, scores, but through our website, you can send an email. We're happy to respond to everybody from OSHA and let them know which test makes more sense. And there is some nuance to figuring that, that out. For you guys, it should be easy because you took both of these tests uh, close in proximity during your 10th grade year. So we, we can um, help you make that decision. And I will type uh, that link in there if anybody wants that information as well. There is that one. And then I'll have it come up on your screen. Uh, so if you if you do need a mock exam, because for some reason you missed the PSAT or you missed the pre-ACT, we're also happy to give you a free mock exam so that you can make that comparison. Uh, and again, there's no, no charge, no obligation, no, no trickery to that. We've worked with OSHA for a long time. We're happy to help any families over there in any way that we can. And you can also use this link down here at the bottom of your screen, testprepgurus.com to send that email and just say, hey, I'm trying to figure out which score is better than the other one. Uh, can, you, can you give me more information on that? And our, our people, our team are happy to do that for you. And then on the ACT, so on your pre-ACT, the main, the main thing you need to understand is that it's on a different scoring scale. It goes from one to 36, and it's an average of these four sections right here, math, science, English, and reading. So they average those scores together. Uh, and, and that's really all you need to know from, from these two tests, however, on the PSAT in particular, I would encourage every student, when you log in, this has to be done online, you go into your account, you can see the questions that you missed and then click on those and you'll see an explanation for those questions. I would encourage every student to take advantage of that opportunity uh, just to help build your skills when it comes to these tests. The pre-ACT has a version of that, but it is, it's not nearly as good as the PSAT version. So um, to, to just understand your strengths and weaknesses on these tests, I would use the PSAT to study the questions. Um, and then when you're comparing the two scores, as it stands right now, if your scores are roughly equal, go with the ACT. Uh, again, if the scores are roughly equal, go with the ACT. And the reason for that is there's less material to study. They don't test. So the SAT actually has lower level math and higher level math. The ACT is much more in the middle. 
it's a, bit, a very similar thing on the verbal side where the SAT test three times as many grammar rules as the ACT does. So you can improve scores on either test, of course. It just, it's gonna take less time to improve your score on the ACT. So if there's any doubt or the scores are roughly equal, go with the ACT. Hmm. There we go, okay. And then the summer before 11th grade, you should know what score you're going to use. You wanna make that decision if tests are going to help your applications. Pick out test dates, two or three of them that make sense over the course of your junior year and the, and the either the summer before senior year or one of those tests right in the fall of your senior year. Um, for most students, what makes the what makes the most sense though is to pick one or two dates during the junior year or um, plus one or two dates that are in the summer before senior year. That is the uh, really the sweet spot for prepping. Although these days we do see a lot of students that you take advantage of both summers. So they'll use the summer before junior year to prep and take an official test and then use the summer before senior year to prep and take a test. And the reason for that is just that students are so impacted. There's so much going on in during the school year that the summer is a little bit easier time to prepare for tests and, and get that score that really shows colleges what you can do in school. And then as far as different options to prepare there, you can uh, you can self prep. Uh, I've seen it work. Uh, it, it is a lot less effective than going with a classroom or working with a one on one teacher. Um, but I have seen it work for highly motivated students. Classroom programs, and, and again, we're not here to um, to talk about test prep gurus tonight, so I'm not, this, there's no, no advertisements here. We're just giving good information for everybody. Um, we offer all of these uh, various services, but I'm not, I'm not going to go into detail on any of those services tonight. Um, classroom programs tend to have, they, they do have more students in them, um, and so that can be a, a nice uh, value proposition for families that, that don't want to put um, a ton of resources into this process, but do want to improve their scores. Uh, then one-on-one, -on -one, because that's customized to the student, there's a lot more time and energy invested into that process. And then it's customized to that individual student when you meet, what you work on, um, and it's the best way to really maximize your scores. Um, but uh, for, for their different, different options make sense for different families. And so I wanna make sure everybody knows what all three of those options are. And then last year, uh, as, we, as we're coming to the, to the end, um, I think a really good idea is to not think of these tests as assessments, think of them as opportunities, opportunities to win scholarships, gain access to these selective colleges, and in that preparation process, if it's done the right way, you should be building skills that entire time. You should learn to read faster for a higher level of retention. Your writing should improve by working on the grammar rules that these tests look at. It certainly will help your math and your grades in math classes. Um, and that science section on the ACT has been shown to improve students' ability to interpret visual data. So a lot of benefits to these exams when they're put in their proper context. Okay, I'm gonna jump on to questions next because I know there are plenty of them. Um, and then last thing here, if anybody wants the slides from this presentation, a recording will be put up uh, through OSHA, but if you, if you want just the actual slides, we're more than happy to send those to you. If you need a mock exam or just need to understand which score is a little bit better, this is the, the link to reach us at. Um, and if you do send us an email there or you just want our, we, we send a newsletter uh, roughly every other month. We'll send one out that just has updates on the latest in college admissions. Um, and in an environment where a lot of things are changing, especially in California, getting those updates can be very helpful for our 10th grade, 11th grade families, um, just so you're always on the front foot and know the latest uh, at various colleges. Okay, so let's catch our breath for a second. That was a ton of information, I know. Um, I'm going to go look at these 
questions and look for ones that we haven't uh, answered already. Oh, no, this is a good one. We have amazing counselors at OSHA and a great college fair. Do we still need to hire a college application helper or a private college counselor? My feeling on it, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, is, is no, you don't need, you absolutely don't need to. Some families will still do it, um, but I think at a school, I, I would agree with what's implied in the question. You have such a strong counseling department at OSHA. I, I don't think that is necessary. And I know the counselors at OSHA, um, they want to work with the students. Uh, they want to get involved with them. They want to help you through every aspect of this process. So I don't, it's not wrong to, to go out and get somebody if you feel that's right for you. Um, but I, I certainly don't think you need to with the talented staff that you have at OSHA. Uh, Nick, I would agree with that. I yeah. had responded to the question just personally. Oh, okay. Uh, my personal experience as a parent is uh, I think exactly what you do, that we have amazing counselors here. And my daughter is a senior. She just finished the application process and we did not hire a counselor, um, an additional counselor for her. We relied on our OSHA counselors and I think they did a fantastic job. So if that, if that helps from an from a OSHA parent perspective. Right. Excellent. Excellent. That that's that that's the most important perspective. Um, next question. So, if a student has an IEP or or a five hundred four, uh, will they receive accommodations on the SAT or the ACT? Yes, you can. There there are different ways to apply for those accommodations on either test. You you need to do that through your high school. So the first step is going to be to email your counselor and say, "I would like to apply for accommodations on one or both tests," and then your counselors will help walk you through that process and how to apply for that. Um, and for any students, because uh, there's always a follow up question with this, for our mock exams that we give uh, to students um for free we we can also set you up with accommodations with whatever you're approved for um for those mock tests so that you have a realistic idea of what you're going to score um and and yeah we're more than happy to do that okay we covered these so many questions can you take an SAT exam during the summer between 10th and 11th grade, or is it too early? So you can take a test uh, virtually at any time in, in the high school process. They're more or less offered year round now. Um, and, and you just go to the website for SAT or ACT, all those dates are listed. Is it too early to take it between 10th and 11th grade? Now, that's a very individual question. And what I would say is, again, talk to your trusted counselor. Feel free to contact us. We will look at your specific scores. And then we're going to ask, hey, what are some of the colleges you're looking at applying to, to try to determine whether or not that would make sense to take an early exam? And so for some students where the, the colleges they want to apply to uh, have typical scores that are much higher than what the, where the student is currently scoring, we're probably going to recommend uh, that it would be too early. Whereas if you're if you're close to that range or in that range or above that range, then we'd say, by all means, let's let's do it. Go ahead and do it now before uh, just whenever it's convenient for you. And so um, we see plenty of students that are successful taking those tests between 10th and 11th grade, but it is very individualized whether or not that's a good decision. And there's another question about accommodations. I would just say the longer your history of having accommodations in high school and documentation um, from uh, various professionals inside the high school, outside the high school that, that document why you would need those accommodations, that's really the key to getting them in light of the shenanigans that were pulled 
in 2019, 18 and 19, um, where we had families applying for them that didn't need them, uh, they, they are strict in, in giving out those accommodations. And so documentation is really the key. Again, work with your counselor um, to secure those accommodations. And then to answer Erica here, yes, the official SAT test uh, can absolutely be taken before the academic senior year. Um, ideally, yeah, you'll have your tests done before you start senior year or, or right at the beginning of senior year. Uh, there's so much going on when you're actually applying to colleges, doing everything that, that you have to do as a senior, plus preparing for and taking your tests. It's not something you want to leave until your senior year. Uh, you there, and maybe this was already answered, but you're not able to pick up a written copy of the PSAT anymore. They don't, they don't do that. So there's a written copy of the PSAT, uh, sorry, written copy of the pre-ACT. Your PSAT has to be accessed online. Should you take the optional essay on the ACT? No, you should not. Uh, that is being phased out. And so you do not need to take the optional the optional essay on the ACT. Uh, those those are going away and and prove to not be terribly helpful to college admissions officers. And and just to be clear, I don't want to cause any confusion. I'm there. Uh, up until recently, there was an essay at the end of these standardized tests, a short essay that you would answer right there in the in the room. That's what I'm saying is going away. College admissions essays, where you put your blood, sweat, and tears into an essay that you work on and then send with your application, those are still very important. And uh, yeah, so I, I hope that that difference makes sense. And yes, I will email the slides. Just let us know that you want them at, at this place so that we have an email address to email the slides at that link on your screen. And no, colleges do not prefer SAT over the ACT or vice versa. They really just want to see the higher score. Um, every college is familiar with both tests and, and no, so they don't prefer one over the other. It used to be that case. I mean, we're talking more than 20 years ago, but the myth still persists to this day that some colleges like one test over the other. It is really not true. The colleges just want to see the highest possible score that you can send them. And that is because that helps them in the in the ranking system and helps to, again, have that common yardstick against other students. This would be a good moment, though, to mention super scores, which are uh, have those along with test optional super scores have become uh, much more common at colleges, which just means if we looked at, say, say an SAT score and you took the test twice and one time you scored higher on the math and lower on the verbal and the next time it was reversed send them both of those tests. They'll take the higher of those two scores and combine them into a super score when they're looking at you as an applicant. The same thing applies on the ACT, and it can really be useful there because, again, we have four subjects on the ACT, reading, English, math, and science. And so often the super score really helps on the ACT. And I'm just getting into the nuance here. Uh, there, because we're in a test optional environment and we also have score choice, which means when you take your scores, I would encourage every student, don't fill in any colleges to automatically send your scores. Just take the test. Don't fill in names of colleges that you're interested on those tests. See what they are. Then you make the decision later in the process on which scores you're going to send them. And I, I think there's a slightly higher fee when you do it that way. But we're, we're talking, I, I believe it's 15 or $20, well worth the price in order to have control over your own information. Um, and for all my students, and I know we've been at this um, now for nearly an hour, um, but I do want to make sure that we, we get clear on this point. A lot of students feel obligated to put in colleges where it says colleges that you're interested in when you actually take your standardized tests. Again, just leave those blank because you're there by yourself and there's no one to ask for help when you get to that part of the application and, and everybody just doesn't want to do it wrong. So they think they need to fill it out. You don't stay in control of your own information and make your own decisions uh, later in the process. 
Okay. Uh, the for reviewing questions on these the pre ACT and the PSAT, you can do it for both tests. I would recommend concentrating on the PSAT first, only because they have a better system that helps you understand the questions, better explanations as to what you got right and wrong. But again, if your scores are roughly equal, you're probably going to go down the ACT path long term. And if you're like, man, this is too much information and I'm, you're, you just keep saying all these acronyms and I'm not sure, again, email us. Our team is happy to just answer those questions and uh, it's, it's second nature to, to us over here. Um, best time to apply for the accommodations? Sooner the better. Sooner the better. I, if you're in 10th grade, then it's, it's uh, well, you're, you've got plenty of time. And if you're already documented with your IEP at school, it, it should be pretty straightforward. But I, I think the sooner you start that process, the easier it is um, to make sure it doesn't get in the way of your actual tests. Okay. Oh, would it make sense to prepare for the SAT in order to get ready for the PSAT junior year? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you're preparing for, for two tests in one and the SAT is a little bit harder. So you'll be extra prepared for the PSAT. So yeah, if you're going down the self-prep route, that is a, a very good idea. Does test prep gurus offer college counseling? We do not. We want to be the experts in uh, in helping students to boost their scores. Obviously, we're happy to answer any college admissions related questions, but no, we do not offer that service. Uh, it's one of the reasons we like working with schools like OSHA, where we have expert counselors that can help you answer those specific questions for you individually, and then we can individually help you with your scores. And can you take the SAT multiple times, but only submit your highest score? Yes, and I, I think I just addressed that, but I wanna make sure that's clear. We do have score choice. So you can take it multiple times and only send colleges the one that you like the best. Uh, qualifications for the National Merit Scholarship besides the PSAT score. Really, the, the first step is just the PSAT score. If that score is high enough, there are a few other steps to that process, but your counselors are going to walk you through that. And all of that will actually happen senior year. So you take the PSAT junior year. That's the score that determines if you're going to qualify or not. And then senior year, there'll be a couple extra steps that you'll need to take. Um, but really, you won't have to take the, the score is the step that you should be focused on now, given uh, that we're talking to all 10th and 11th graders. Am I seeing lower scores overall after Zoom learning? Oh, this is a good question. In general, yes. I think math seems to be the place that was hit hardest by the Zoom learning. And it's no one's fault. Um, that And that's across the board. That's not any one high school. I mean, we're really all in the same boat with that. It did seem to be particularly hard, though, for students in math classes and then especially given all the craziness of the situation, no one wanted to hold any students back or fail them. Um, and it was much more difficult to assess students. I mean, I think it was just a really, a really challenging environment for teachers and students alike. Um, but yeah, one of the consequences of that are slightly lower scores on these tests. I don't think any of that is permanent, though. I think it's just a matter of putting in the extra work, whether that is because you feel behind, now you're taking a more advanced math class and you need to catch up, or if it's on the ACT and you want to improve your scores, the ACT, the SAT, and that math class, what they all have in common is that if you put in the hard work and the time and energy, you will be rewarded in that process, whether that means you'll do better on the tests uh, or you'll have receive a higher score. Uh, it's all about learning the material and, and that, if you learn that material, th these are not IQ tests. Uh, they, were never, they were never meant to be, they never have been, they never will be. They really are measuring 
verbal and mathematical fundamentals. And so if you study the material and get better at those fundamentals, you will score higher. Uh, I'm almost to the bottom here of all the questions. I'm just trying to get to everybody here. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, do studying SAT questions help if you're planning to take the ACT? Yes, they do. The tests have a lot more in common than they do differences. So by all means, uh, studying standardized test questions will help you for both exams. Oh, that's Now that's an interesting question. If one test causes more anxiety and stress than the other, should you go with the test that causes less stress? I would say it depends on the severity of that anxiety. In my experience, 99% of students, when they spend time with either exam and someone walks them through every facet of the test and shows them, hey, this is what was on the test you took. These are all the things that could be on a future test. And then gets that student comfortable with all the things that might come up on their test, with all the concepts that might come up. Those anxiety levels are going to go down in general, and that's going to apply to both tests. Um, but I do hear that a lot. I mean, some students feel the time pressures on one test or another might be more stressful. But again, familiarity you, is, is the best recipe to lower that anxiety. And so usually you want to go with the test that uh, where you're, you've got a better starting spot and then, and then become familiar with it and what, that should handle that anxiety. I did say somebody asked, yeah, um, did I say that the writing supplement on the ACT is going to be phased out? Yes, I did. It is going to be phased out and on the SAT as well. And then the optional questions on both exams you do not need to answer them. It will not hurt you. Honestly, what, they're, what, what the test agencies do, well, what the colleges do, the colleges say, hey, if you can, uh, we want, they want to buy information so they can market to students. So if you listed USC as one of your five schools on, the, on that test, then USC knows you're interested and they can start sending you marketing materials. It doesn't help you to, uh, to gain admission to that college. But again, colleges want to spur people to take actions, which is to apply to their colleges. And so that's what that information is for. And so it's, it is a hundred percent optional and I would recommend not filling it out. The percentiles. So the percentiles are grade level based. However, the percentiles on the PSAT are a little inflated. Uh, I'm not going to get into all the details of that. Um, again, I, I, when comparing the two scores, I it really is important to talk to someone who's been through this before, whether that's one of your OSHA counselors or somebody uh, with with our group, um, because they they'll they can look through and, and and just quickly make sure that you're coming to the right conclusion on which test is going to be better for you. And again, those PSAT percentiles, we do need to see if an adjustment was made this year because the scores are just coming out. Um, and so, I, but, but for every year since they revamped it, the PSAT percentiles have been a bit inflated. And mostly it's just because they know that a lot of parents use that to determine which tests they're going to take. And the SAT is in the same place. They want people to choose their test instead of the other one. So again, um, talk to somebody that just does this all day, every day. And in five minutes, they can help you determine to which test is better. Um, and yes, Test Prep Gurus does offer private tutoring services, but we're not here to, to talk about that tonight. We're just here to answer college admissions questions. And the last one, here we go. Can you repeat when is the best time for a junior or senior to take the SAT or ACT? All right, this is our last question. Then we're going to wrap it up. Thank you, everybody, for hanging in there tonight. I, I can't believe everybody has uh, stayed in there and been so attentive. And, and, um, and I really appreciate all these great informed questions tonight. The best time um, for a junior or senior to take the test. So I would say anytime, if you're in the 10th grade now, anytime uh, you wanna figure out which test is better for you during 10th grade. So during 10th grade, determine which test is better for you. 
If your scores are where you want them to be by the summer after 10th grade, some students will take tests then, although that's the early path. Most students will take tests during their junior year. And that could be early in the junior year. It could be late in the junior year. That all depends on your schedule and personal preferences. Obviously, don't try to prep when you're in the middle of a varsity sport in the lead, when you're the lead in the school of play, that sort of thing. Do it when you have time and energy to prepare. And then your last test is hopefully going to be scheduled in that summer or just the summer before senior year or just before senior year begins. Um, and a, a September ACT is also a very popular date. School just started, but you were able to do most of the prep during the summer. And so that's the, that's the timeline. And yeah, if your son is a junior, there are many more testing dates available. Um, I can, if you actually, one of the things we will email every, every, anybody that asks for the slides or reaches out to us through that contact, there's one more flyer I can send you that has all the test dates for both tests throughout the year and just spells it out a little more easier in a, in a, a more co coherent fashion than going to the various websites. Um, and with that, I'm going to wrap it up. And any closing remarks from um, uh, from OSHA, we will have that. But thank you so much for your time, for your energy. Feel free to email us with any lingering questions. We're, we're happy to answer it. I mean, we're here to help students um, in any way that we can. So um, yeah, I, use this as a resource. We're here to help. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you to students and parents for uh, taking the time to be interested um, in your own or your students' um, success and uh, anxiety reducing strategies as they uh, look forward to the next one, two, three, four years and beyond. Um, we appreciate you joining us. Again, if you have any other questions um, for Nick, you can email him at um, Prep Gurus and ask them questions. And please take advantage of the wonderful counselors that we have here. Thank you so much. All right. Good night, everybody.